I would invite you to find your way to the book of Revelation chapter 7 as we continue this series that I hope is uh, gradually, uh, yet surely, hopefully, uh, beginning to come together. I hope today it has more clarity than last week, and last week had more clarity than the week before. Um, if you have found that that seems to be the case, or that the last couple of times uh, things have not just been um, exactly gelling in your mind, that's okay, that's normal. A uh, big attribute of this book is that uh, we only begin to understand the earlier parts as we understand the latter parts, which is why I suggested last time and reminded you that in the first century, as this letter was circulated to those seven churches, it would have been read corporately, publicly, and all in one setting. It would not have been, uh, you know, a 25-week series. It would have just been a letter that was read, and things would have begun to make sense uh, as the letter in its totality was read. But there is one fundamental truth underlying every single verse of the book of Revelation. And I believe that without keeping this truth firmly in the forefront of our thoughts, we are going to find ourselves in uh, a sea uh, of details. We're going to find ourselves adrift uh, in those details. And we're going to miss the forest for the trees. And what I mean by that is we must keep in mind the central key message that God is communicating to us, that Jesus is revealing to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos as he is communicating this revelation. And here is that central truth. If you're taking notes, this is something you're going to want to write down. And you're going to want to evaluate every single verse of the book of Revelation in light of this single central truth. And here it is. The triune God... That is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is sovereignly. That means He is in control of every aspect of it. The triune God is sovereignly bringing this present age to its appropriate and God-glorifying end. And He will accomplish this through two means. Number one, he will accomplish it through his righteous judgment upon sin and sinners. And secondly, he will accomplish it through his gracious love and faithfulness to believers who are also sinners rescued by grace. So I want to remind you one more time of that because it's really important that the central truth of this is that recognizing here in this 21st century, here 2,000 plus years removed from Jesus' birth in Nazareth, his growth in a birth in Bethlehem, his growth in Nazareth, his crucifixion in Jerusalem, his resurrection in Jerusalem, his ascension to the Father, and now in his heavenly session, we are already but not yet in the kingdom. We are already changed spiritually. We are already part of the body of Christ. We are already part of the bride of Christ, but we are not yet what we will be. And the book of Revelation is a beautiful message from God Himself to every single believer in the time from Jesus' first coming to His second coming to remind them we win. God wins. Sin is done with. In one very real sense, sin and death has already been defeated in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But in another sense, it is something that we are longing for, we are waiting for. It is the expression Maranatha, which means come, Lord Jesus. It should be on our lips, it should be on our hearts, it should be in our minds that Jesus would return, that he would glorify himself through his return. So tonight, or tonight, this morning we come to the book of Revelation, chapter 7, 
And I want to remind you that any time we come to Scripture, we come with certain presuppositions, certain prejudices. And what we mean by that is we have certain preconceived judgments about what we feel is reality. We all have worldviews, don't we? And so any given discussion, you are approaching or any given argument or any given article that you read or any given television event that you watch or any given event online, you're coming with certain worldview presuppositions. So let's take one that's simple. Let's say you have an affinity for apples rather than oranges. You like apples, you don't like oranges. Well, that is going to color any discussion that you have about fruit. Do you understand? You, you cannot, because of your presupposed preference for apples, you cannot come truly neutral to any discussion, right? We all have those worldviews, and those are good. Those are God-given in many cases. So to the best of our ability, we don't want to approach the text with preconceived ideas. I'm asking you to let's allow the text to teach us what God wants, not read into it what we think, right? Because you're going to notice some familiar terms. If you have an ESV Bible that I'm reading from, you see the little heading right above the number 7, the 144,000 of Israel sealed. So you might, depending on the context in which you were raised, say to yourself, oh, I already know all about that. I know that's the 144,000 witnesses, and they represent Jesus, and they go out in the world during the time of the tribulation. Okay, maybe. But let's let the text reveal God's desire for us. So before we read, I want to remind you of something that regardless of your end times view that we've talked about, dispensationalism, premillennialism, um, uh, historic premillennialism, uh, amillennialism, postmillennialism, preterist, idealist, any of those different views, and some of you are saying, I don't even know what page you're on. That's okay. That's okay. It doesn't, it, it's okay. We want to see what God has for us. But what we can all agree on is there are basically two phases to the church's existence at any given time. There is what we might call the church militant. Okay? When I say militant in this context, do not think something akin to uh, extreme Islamic fundamentalist kind of militism. But it is a proper term to say there is the church militant. We, might, we could even probably say the church missional if we wanted to. Compared to the church triumphant. So the church militant is a church that is actively engaged in spiritual warfare, in gospel proclamation, in evangelism, in discipleship. We are in the war. Okay? As opposed to the church triumphant, which has finished the war in the sense that they are home with the Lord. They have heard because of God's grace in the gospel, well done, good and faithful servant. So we, everybody who's in this room, is part of the church militant. Those that we love, so many who have gone on before us, that great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 12, or excuse me, in 11, are, are those who have gone before us. Those who are the church triumphant, the church victorious. And one day, all of us will be the church triumphant. So I believe that this chapter describes the difference between those two. 
So the church militant are those believers who are at this moment living on earth, secure in our victory in Christ, but engaged in the work of spiritual warfare and the activity of sharing the gospel. But the church triumphant are those believers who are now part of that great cloud of witnesses, of Hebrews, that are triumphant. They have realized the victory they have in Christ. So I want to keep, I want to ask you to keep those things in mind as we read chapter seven. Okay, so Revelation chapter seven. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. And then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben 12,000 from Gad, 12,000 from Asher, 12,000 from Naphtali, 12,000 from Manasseh, 12,000 from Simeon, 12,000 from Levi, 12,000 from Issachar, 12,000 from Zebulun, 12,000 from Joseph, 12,000 from Benjamin were sealed. And after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know, as if to say, you're asking me? You know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And who who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What we've just read in chapter 7 is one of a couple of interludes in the book of Revelation. Another word we might use is an um, intermission, a pause, a change of direction, a change of scenery. Now, we'll talk about the others as we come to them, but this is the first interlude. And notice where it happens. What was the last thing we read about in chapter 6? Verse 12, when he opened the sixth seal. And then there's this great natural devastation that happens. Just, I mean destruction. People are saying, you know, let the mountains fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So who is the originator of the effects of this seal and all the seals? God. They originate from the throne They pass through the living creatures and they are carried out at the execution and the will of God. Okay? This is God using that which is destructive as 
his judgment in righteousness. So, again, what was the last thing we saw in verse in chapter 6? Six seal. How many seals are there total? Seven seals. So what we would expect to read in Revelation 7 verse 1 is, and the seventh seal, but we don't. There's this pause, there's this interlude. And I'm firmly convinced that when we understand the structure of the book of Revelation, it really helps take a lot of the mystery and the enigma out of the interpretation. It really starts to just fit. It makes sense, you know? Oh, John wasn't just out of his mind with details. It all makes sense. And as we've already mentioned, different people understand chapter 7 differently, but I want us to look at it with a fresh view. I understand that many of us, myself included, were taught to understand the book of Revelation as being when the Bible says Israel, that means Israel. When the Bible says the church, that means the church. But I want to challenge you throughout this series in Revelation, might it be the case that John as well as the other New Testament writers are understanding both Israel and the church as the total people of God from creation to new creation. Now just bear with me before we start throwing the eggs and the stones and everything else. Just give me a second. I think a very strong case can be made that what we have in chapter 7, listen closely, is a further explanation or extrapolation of the fifth seal. You remember what the fifth seal is? Go back to chapter 6, verse 9. So we got the four horsemen, and then we have the sixth seal, that is like total natural disaster destruction. And right before the fourth, right after the fourth horseman, before the sixth seal, you got this very peculiar fifth seal, don't you? Because all the other seals are God's wrath poured out on the sinful world. But the fifth seal is peculiar. It says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they borne. They had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Not a bad verse for an international day of prayer for the persecuted church. And then, they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their n number and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. The fifth seal is a contrast between the church militant and the church triumphant. You've got the church who are in heaven, the, the believers who are there, who've been killed, who have died in this tribulation. And I'm not limiting this to seven physical years. I'm talking about the time of Jesus' resurrection all the way to the end when he comes again. I'm not denying that there is a great tribulation, a more concentrated tribulation, a literal antichrist towards the end, but as First John says, there are already many antichrists who have gone out among us, and I'm also not limiting this just to physical martyrs those who've been killed in the name of Christ, rather those who have died who are in the faith, who have died because of the impact of sin. Guess what? All of us die, you know why? Because of sin. Not necessarily directly because of your sin. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes you die because of your sin. Did you know that? If you get behind the wheel, intoxicated, and begin to drive in a frantic sporadic manner, and you die, it could be said, oh, he died because he sinned. Your sin had a direct consequence of your death. 
On the other hand, sometimes it's not so direct, is it? Because the wages of sin is death. And even though in Christ we've been born again and that sin debt has been forgiven and we are new creations, guess what? Death still exists in the world because of sin. Maybe I'm not the one behind the wheel intoxicated. Maybe I'm the victim of the one behind the wheel intoxicated. Still the death is related to sin. Even the person who at the age of 115 passes peacefully in the night, their physical death is still a result of the reality of sin. Not necessarily their particular sin, like they did something the night before, but sin. We live in a fallen world. And when we die whether it was because of persecution or natural death, we enter into the church triumphant. I believe that chapter 7 is further explaining the nature of these who are the souls beneath the altar of the fifth seal. The only seal that kind of seems out of place. So the interlude, the intermission, further explains... So, what am I saying? The church militant, according to chapter 7, is sealed in Christ. Verses 1 through 8 explain how believers are sealed so that they can persevere through the first four tribulations enumerated in chapter 6 and the sixth seal as well. And then in verses 9 through 17, we see the heavenly reward of those who do persevere. So I believe in short, chapter 7 deals with the question of what is happening to believers during these cycles of judgment on non-believers. This is a big problem a lot of people have with the idea of tribulation and Christians being present in it. Do you realize that? Because guess what? Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says there, is, says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? We are not under condemnation. So we should not be the recipients of the things that we see happening to those who are at the hands of the first, second, third, fourth horsemen. Amen? We should not. So for some the answer is then we must logically be raptured before that happens so that we're off scene. Or, maybe, just maybe, there is a means by which God protects His own in the midst of judgment, though they are susceptible to the enemy's destruction. Do you see that in, in the world today and in the great tribulation, there are two forces at work. God is dispensing His righteous justice on the wicked, but guess what? The beast is coming after the woman as well, as we'll see later in Revelation. The devil delights in nothing more than your death. Now, he cannot call for the time of your death. He has no say in that. But he can pursue you with the intent of killing you, right? Remember Job? Everything is fair game except for death. So I don't think that we read chapter 7. When we read it, it's totally unrelated to the promises that Jesus makes in the first three chapters. Remember? The sealing of the saints further explains how Jesus will, quote, Keep them from the hour of trial, which is to test the earth dwellers. Remember back in chapter 3, verse 10? The, how does he do that? Well, we have a biblical precedent for this. Do you remember the ten plagues of Egypt? Do you remember where the Israelites were during the plagues of Egypt? They were in a region of the land called Goshen. And Goshen was exempted from the effects of the plague. Maybe because symbolically God had done what? He had sealed them and protected them 
from the plagues. So here in verse 1 of chapter 7 of Revelation, we have four angels holding back the four winds. Now you can cross-reference that. I'm not going to take time to go there, but Zechariah chapter 1, verse 8, identical language. So I'm fairly confident that the four winds are the angels holding back the four horsemen of chapter 6 so that we have a kind of restraining power. Why? Why are these winds of judgment being held back? Because something has to happen first. This is not chronologically after chapter 6. It's actually describing the condition of believers before and during and after chapter 6. What do I mean? Well, I think that the identification of the winds with the horsemen means that the sealing of believers that happens in verses 2 through 8 takes us back before the time of the unleashing of the four horsemen. It's, all, it's like a, what I like to call a meanwhile back at the ranch moment, right? So you're following a story chronologically, and then meanwhile back at the ranch earlier that morning, something else is going on. So don't see this as happening later. The, the 144,000 are being sealed as protection against the four horsemen and the seven seals that are coming. So I think this harming of the earth is nothing other than all the devastation of chapter 6. And that would be meaningless if all of this is happening after that. Now in verse 2, we have another angel. One descending, I mean, excuse me, ascending from the rising sun with a seal. This is a time immediately preceding the plagues of chapter 6. A time when God gives believers a seal to protect them against the onslaught of the woes. So again, there's this idea that it doesn't necessarily mean removal. It means protection in the midst of. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Fiery furnace. Did God remove them from the fiery furnace or was he with them in the midst of the fiery furnace protecting them from harm? In the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the trial. So the angels are to delay carrying out their commission until the commanding angels, these helpers, have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. Therefore... God's servants must be sealed before these wrathful events happen that happen in six can be set in motion. There would be no apparent purpose for providing believers with a protecting seal if they had already experienced the tribulations of chapter six. Be a little after the fact, right? A little bit late. Therefore, this sealing activity must take place before those. Now, I want to think about the sealing. Who, who is it that's sealed? Well, of course, this is a big discussion among evangelicals. Is this literally 144,000 Israelites, or is it symbolic of something else? Is it all of the redeemed going through this time of this present age and tribulation? Well, I think it's the latter, personally, for a couple of reasons that I want to point out to you. Number one, the nature of the list. Twelve multiplied by twelve, the perfect square, then multiplied by a thousand. A hundred and forty-four thousand. The perfect, the, the fullness of the people of Israel. A hundred and forty-four thousand. Twelve twelves times a thousand. Now, if you look at the list, though, this list in Revelation 7 does not agree with any of the 20-plus lists in the entire Old Testament. It doesn't match any list of the 12 tribes that we have anywhere else in any of the Bible. It is indeed the weirdest list you will run across. 
It has anomaly after anomaly. Dan is not even there. Dan is totally omitted from the list. Judah is listed first, which is highly unusual for a listing of the 12 tribes. Ephraim is gone from the list. But Joseph is listed. Joseph is listed and his son Benjamin is listed. But Ephraim is not. In most lists, Benjamin and Ephraim are the two tribes representative of the son, Joseph. Manasseh, exactly. There's all kinds of things going on in here. And, and, and probably most importantly, Judah is first. What is the nature of the seal, though? If you turn back very quickly to Ezekiel chapter 9... Let's just look at this real quick. Well, we got to move. What time is it? I only have 45 minutes more of this sermon, so. <laughs> then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, Ezekiel chapter 9. Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen with a writing case at his waist. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare, and you shall not show pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark. And they began at my sanctuary. And so they began with the elders who were before the house. And then he said to them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And so they went out and struck in the city. And while they were striking, I was left alone and I fell on my face and I cried, Ah, oh Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? And then he said to me, The guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. For they say the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. And as for me, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will bring their deeds upon their heads. And behold, the man clothed in linen and in the writing case at his waist brought back word saying, I have done as you commanded. And then we read of the, the, the departure of the glory of the Lord from the temple, remember? Where it leaves, we saw in Mark so prophetically, the last place it's seen before it departs is what? Mount of Olives. Holy Week, Passion Week, last week of Jesus' life. Where does he enter Jerusalem from? Mount of Olives. In Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord leaves the temple basically leaves Israel and it doesn't return until the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world returns to Jerusalem and brings the glory back. And through His death and resurrection provides the seal that Paul defines as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the seal of the believer. It doesn't necessarily... listen. I'm not saying this may not be a literal seal, but don't limit yourself to thinking it's a literal seal. Not only here, but when we get to the seal of the Antichrist. So many people have convinced themselves, well, obviously the seal is going to be a barcode on my head or my hand, or they're going to insert a computer trip, a chip into my wrist, and, and I'm not going to be able to buy... No, friends. The seal means ownership. When you love yourself rather than Christ, you already have the seal. You are already a child of the enemy rather than a child of God. Anyone who is outside of Christ has already been marked with the seal of Antichrist. And 
only those who are marked with the seal of Christ belong to Him. And so, the seal marks all those who are God's, just as the mark of Antichrist mark all that is His. And the sealing enables them to respond in faith and trust to the trials through which they will pass, so that these trials become the very instruments by which they can be strengthened in their faith. That's the church militant. The church militant, on the march, on the move, sealed. We don't have to fear death. Death is a defeated foe. We only need fear the Lord. But then notice, remember early on I told you to watch carefully for this language of hearing and seeing? Do you remember back in chapter 4? When it says... that he... It says that he heard, verse 5, one of the elders said to me, I heard, weep no more, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so he can open the scroll and the seals. So he's just said, don't worry, John, there is a lion, which was the symbol of the, the, the tribe of Judah. There is a lion who is able to open the scroll. And then look at verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw, I saw with my eyes a lamb standing as though it had been slain. I heard lion, I saw lamb. Now keep that same interpretive tool in mind as you come to chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard... I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now skip down to verse 9. But after this I looked. After this I looked, and instead of seeing 144,000, behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. So if chapter 7, 1 through 8 is the church militant, the martyrs, but sealed in Christ, then chapter 7, verses 9 through 17 is the church triumphant, the martyrs marching into heaven singing hymns as they stand before the throne. I am personally confident, as I've been arguing, that this group is the heavenly counterpart to those who are on earth. So 144,000 is the totality of the people of God on earth and the, the multitude no one can number is the totality of the people of God in heaven from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And even if you're not content to hold that position, what we must all agree on is that these are two pictures of believers. One on earth and one in heaven. Church militant, church triumphant. And look at the worship of the multitude just very quickly. All of verses 9 and 10 are really an echo of chapters 4 and 5. It's like we've heard this before somewhere. Yeah, chapters 4 and 5. Remember that beautiful worship that took place? So much of what is happening is identical. Look at the language. Therefore the multitudes in 7, 9 are the consummate fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and appear to be another of the manifold ways in which John refers to Christians as Israel. Standing before the throne in white robes and palm branches singing about salvation. And not only are they there, but the elders are there and the angels are there. Blessing, thou hast made us, we are thine. Thou hast redeemed us, we are doubly thine. And glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. That's not a bad pattern for worship, is it? 
I would fully commend that to you. The next time you are in your quiet time or you want to spend some time with the Lord, you think, I, you know, Lord, I just don't even know where to start. I, I, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say. Use that verse as a pattern. Use verse 12 of chapter 7 as a pattern. Blessing. Talk to God about how much of a, a blessing He is. The blessings He provides to you. Talk to God about how glorious He is. Extol His attributes. You are worthy. You are strong. You are mighty. You are omnipotent. You are omniscient. You are gracious. You are just. You are merciful. You are long-suffering. You can spend hours and move on to His wisdom. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They are high above. And so when you are bogged down by the circumstances of this life and you're confused about why, God, are you allowing these things to happen, remind yourself, He is wise, I am not. He is God, I am not. And He is always right. And He is always on time. Thanksgiving, we know how to do that. Honor, we know how to do that. Power, we know how to do that. Might, to speak of His eternity. What a beautiful pattern of worship. And so the question immediately arises, who are these, this multitude? And the answer is so much more explicit than we have in verses 1 through 8. They are the ones coming out of the tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white. They're innumerable. Now another option is that, God, that John is not here describing only the last day's tribulation, and I believe that is the case, that it's, it's all Christians of all time forward. So the key to really focus on is that they're there by the blood of Christ. We have this little picture of heaven, don't we? We'll serve the Lord forever. Have a totally fulfilling, restful service forever. Perfect. We'll lack nothing, these verses say. Why? Because the presence of the Lamb and He will be our shepherd in the fullest sense of the word. So in summary, to, to wrap all this up, all of chapter 7 is an interlude describing, helping us understand the identity and the actions and the security of the saints and their sealing for victory prior to the pouring out of the seals in chapter 6. And then we'll see next time chapter 8 verse 1 closes the parentheses because what's it about? When the Lamb opened the seventh seal. It's a picture of Christ's victory and His glory in the midst of His judgment. So fear the Lord, but glory in His grace as well. That for those of us in Christ, there is no condemnation. That He who the Son has set free is free indeed. We fear the Lord, but then we immediately recognize that the one who taught us to fear is the one who relieves our fears. Only God can do that. Do you know this, Jesus? I'd love to talk with you more about who He is. Our prayer is, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But that is only the prayer of the believer. That's good news for followers of Christ. But if Jesus comes quickly, that is the worst news for those outside of Christ. I don't say that just to scare you or upset you. I'm simply saying this. Leave this with this on your mind. As you encounter people, as you walk out of this place, as you see men, women, and children, 
Every single person that you see, don't think of them as rich or as poor, as black, as white, from this social class or that social class. You see them and you know they're going to spend eternity in the presence of Jesus or in a lake of fire. That is, you look at them as, as, as they order the same number three combo as you do. They're either a child of God or they're a child of Satan. And the only difference between the two is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this precious gospel. We do not claim perfection, Lord. You know we are not perfect. We are flawed in so many ways. But your grace is sufficient for our weakness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help us to take the words of this book of Revelation and help it to be a motivating confidence to stand firm in the midst of tribulation. Lord, today as we pray for the persecuted church all over this world, prepare our hearts for the day when we may likely be the persecuted church. That we would stand firm to our last breath proclaiming Jesus is Lord. We ask this in His name. Amen.